Hello and welcome to the inaugural, 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 right, let's just cut that out and start again. I can't believe you fudged the first line as well. Hello and welcome to the Split Screen Podcast, episode 10. Uh, last year we made some predictions on games for 2012 and it turned out to go horribly wrong. I am, as ever, joined in the studio by Craig Wilson. Hello, welcome to 2012, it's the future. If you think I'm going to make any comments about a Mayan prophecy, you can forget it. No. No, I'm just, okay. not, I'm just not interested. So, uh, so with all the possible humour out of the way, let's move straight on to the serious topic of what happened last year. So, this is a, I guess this is the first anniversary podcast? It is. It? Yeah. High five. Yeah. Oh, uh, that hold on. Work. I better sign one. There we yeah, go. Yeah, that was better. My hand hurts. Ow. Can't hold my <laughs> mouse now. We don't pretend to be strong and mighty. Uh, so, uh, our first podcast was about the games of 2011, and we talked about what we were interested in, and because we're quite negative chaps, we talked about what we weren't interested in. So we actually managed to help like a good number of games on our list, a number of them were pushed back, a number of them came out, and we were sort of right to ignore them. That's not necessarily because they were bad, but if we look at Dead Space 2... Uh, well, Dead Space 2, I didn't play. Um, and I did say that I wasn't really that bothered. It mm. did get quite a lot of critical acclaim, and I guess it got it got a couple of mixed reviews as well. Um, and it kind of falls into the you know let's pick this up when it's a, a fiver at ASDA kind of category. Yeah, I um, mean we sort of knew we were more or less right as well, thinking about what they would do in Dead Space Two because it was so clearly uh, clear where the faults were in the first game. Yeah. So you need a bit more variety, get a bit more action in there. You probably could say that the fact that it was called Dead Space 2 heavily foreshadowed what was going to be included in that game. That's that's, that's quite rightly. <laughs> I mean, but like Marvel vs. Capcom 3, I wouldn't really know that, what the hell was in that. Oh, you didn't even know what the, uh, the acronym stood for when I wrote it down in the sheet? No. <laughs> uh, so Marvel vs. Capcom 3, I was excited about, and then something went terribly wrong, and I didn't end up playing it. Um, and this is probably going to be a recurring theme throughout this podcast. Um... What's interesting is, it's come out, it's done pretty well, um, and now there's a new version coming out called uh, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Um, I don't know, did you did you buy Street Fighter 4? No, I got Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix and got my ass handed to me, and that humbled me enough that I was too scared to really re-enter the Street Fighter realm after that. Well, I bought, um, I bought Street Fighter 4, I think it was full price when it came out, and I bought Super Street Fighter 4 because it was... You know, a tenor, and at that stage it becomes rude not to buy the games. Mm. Uh, and then it was updated to Arcade Edition, which cost you another tenor on top of your Super Package. So I'm quite reluctant to put money down for Marvel vs. Capcom 3. I think I'm going to wait until Marvel vs. Capcom 4 comes out. Only then will I know it's been fixed in time. <laughs> that's, that's what I said like way back when. I was like, let's just wait for Fall, uh, Oblivion. No, it was, uh, was it Elder Scrolls 6. Yeah. Uh, I can pass on 5. I'll just wait for 6. 6 will be better. Well, yeah. Skyrim as you may know, was my favourite game of the year last year, and I was excited about it. The winner of the 2011 Splitties. Screenies. 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 You've done Screenies. it again. This is just <laughs> this is just reliving past failures. This is just like, hey guys, we've been here for a year just to show you that we haven't learned, we haven't learned we... nothing. We have technical difficulties. You throw water all over the place. I forget to hit record. We yeah. sound slightly better than we did before, but we can still mess up the name. So yeah, Arivian. Tell me about it. Arivian? That was a callback callback to the early episode. <laughs> uh, if anybody hasn't listened to the previous episodes, you should. Um, I, I really love Skyrim, and I am not surprised. I knew, I kind of knew what I was getting into, and I think that's something we're going to discuss on, a, on another podcast at mm. a later date, um, but I really enjoyed it, um, and certainly uh, it did get quite a lot of flack for that, um, because people criticised you know, the, the bugs and the glitches and how it didn't yeah. work properly on their PlayStation. Um, and that's something I intend to address in a blog post. I'm kind of speaking in the future tense, but probably by the time this podcast gets published, you'll have already read it. Um, but suffice to say, yes, there were bugs, but I thought on the whole it was so good that that didn't bother me that much. I think you'd have to be quite naive if you're familiar with Bethesda to think that this type of open world would not be riddled with bugs. Because the world is torn apart by magic. The very... <laughs> core of reality has been twisted by these magic spells so it's only expected that people would sort of freak out, out a bit <laughs> pop out of nowhere <laughs> textures would be popping a bit rocks would be flying in the air and occasionally dragons fly backwards that is part of the mythos of but, Elder Scrolls well this is it if you've got dragons burning the world to cinders rising up out of their graves after thousands of years why should you be able to put your books on a shelf these are dangerous times these, magic these... books need to require a magic library a set in Discworld manned by an orangutan 
Only they can comply with the uh, QA testing orangutans at Bethesda, who obviously so, yeah, <laughs> do they, well. Maybe uh, after the success of Fallout 3, which is slightly less buggy, they couldn't afford chimps sure. anymore, so they moved to orangutans. Yeah. But that's because in Fallout 3, in the post-apocalyptic future, it was right that robots would fall from the sky and things like that. Oh, I see, I see. Whereas in medieval times, one of the most common causes of death, I think, besides disease, was getting your arm stuck in a wall. That's good. Yeah. So, so there you go. That <laughs> game of the year, that's, 2011. That's Skyrim. That's our game of the year, 2011. Arms sticking out of the walls. But seriously, it is very good. And I know you said you weren't interested, mm. but you should get it. Um, I know. Every, that's what everyone has been saying. And I, I look at it, and I've been watching some videos online of people playing, and it does look fun. It is just, I'm not a big, like, there's talking cats in it and stuff. And I don't cats? know, because I'd clearly be into that at other times in private. But when, like in this game, it just doesn't seem appealing. I just, just fantasy games just don't do anything for me. Well, I guess that's that's a fa- that's, that's a better reason to not want to play it rather than there's too many bugs in it and you're yeah. doing consumers it in favor. Com- it's completely. I don't, I don't a, like the setting. That's fine. I, I can yeah. tolerate that. Speaking of games that we didn't like the setting of or anything about them, uh, Duke Nukem Forever came out last year. Um, so that's certainly not something I thought I would have been saying from about 1998 through until now. This was a game that, um, at the time, we said... Duke Nukem Forever, and um, you, you kind of have to buy it, don't you? Mm. I mean, womp womp. Womp indeed. Womp womp we indeed. didn't actually need to buy it. We didn't buy it. Neither of us bought it. Okay, well, I did buy it. Oh, shit, you did? I said I would buy it. I bought it off Amazon. As soon as the item had been shipped, I changed my mind and cancelled my order, but it had already been dispatched from the warehouse. So oh. as soon as the game came in to work, I sent it back. So I did technically buy it, but I sent it back unplayed. Yeah, and so you sent a message. Sent a message. Saying, sent a message. I'm not going to put up your shit. 13 so, years. <laughs> if you had came two weeks early, maybe I'd have played your game. 13 years. It took me 13 seconds to send that back. How does that feel? <laughs> I mean, uh, we, but, uh, I mean we, the, we did discuss it in a blog post why we, we, we weren't going to review it and yeah, weren't going to buy think, it. Um, partly because so many negative reviews have been written that... I felt we didn't have anything particularly new to say. It was yeah, and a, a month before I'd, I'd written um, something because I I'd, I'd had this idea in my head that it'd be really interesting to review Bulletstorm and Duke Nukem at the same in, in a sort of dual review because one of them is they both embrace violence in this kind of very over the top sportsman like way, and um, one got away with it and the other didn't. They're both very crass, but well, I can make that point without playing it. I realised <laughs> why why should I subject myself to this? Um, so yeah, I was. It came. It went. People, as we said, got really hyped up about it. In terms of they created, you know, it was something for people to talk about. It wasn't worth talking about. I, I was hyped up until I played the demo and realized that it was a less fun game to play than the original Quake, mm. which is actually still quite a fun game. Yeah. Um, I just thought it was very clunky. It it wasn't so much that it was old school because something like Serious Sam is old school, if that even means anything in the context of games. It's the fact that it was old fashioned. Yes. And that's really, I think that was really the problem with it. And that's just, you know, if I'm playing a five minute segment of it, considering I've bought Jigmigum 3D, I think I've got it for the PC and the Saturn and the Xbox, and played it numerous times. If even I can't enjoy a five minute demo, there's not much hope for the, the rest of us, is there? Yeah. I think also at the time we said this. But it seems to me that like Duke Nukem, like the time for it is past. And certainly the humour and like the kind of crassness of it, it's, it already came out and it's called Gears of War. So. Did I used to, I, I think I said crassness as well about two minutes ago. I, I just say the same things with years apart. Okay, so we, we've learned two things already in the review of the first year. The first is that uh, if anybody has any high-quality audio equipment, preferably waterproof, they'd like to lend us, that would be great. The second is Craig would like a thesaurus for Christmas or possibly an email subscription to dictionary.com's word of the day. Yes, please. <laughs> and if it comes in Spanish, that is muy good. <laughs> the crassness of his vocabulary knows no bounds. Um, Gears of War three did come out, and this was one that I was at, it was close to getting, but um, I was just. Uh, <laughs> I love see, that we're even doing we're this. In... We're meant to be like this really <laughs> enthusiastic game. So it's like Gears of War three. Nearly bought that one this year. <laughs> as, as it's been established in, in, in the, the year end awards in last year, I don't play games that come out in the year that they. They're released because I'm either too busy playing old games or I'm moving. They're like, they're, have... like, they're like fine wines. You need to let them sit. That's true. They age. They mature. So Gears of War 3 came out. I always thought I was busy moving. Oh, yes, because you moved down to London. I moved down to London at that time, oh, yeah. so it wasn't something that I picked up. 
and it's not the multiplayer game of shooty choice right now amongst my friends, so I'm probably not going to go back there. I wanted to go back there for the campaign, and you've gone through the campaign. I went through the campaign in a one -er. And a once. So how, how how long did that take then? It took about eight to ten hours. We did break for food. Uh, <laughs> you but, blink uh, in between as well. I, I, well, what I had to do was start blinking one eye and then blink the other one to keep them refreshed while letting myself focus on the action. That's um, good. Spreads the load. But Gears, uh, I've did a campaign in a one -er. I played a little bit of Horde, and because my internet connection was so bad, I couldn't really play it. So then I moved to Oxford, um, and then you know, life got in the way, came back at Christmas and my brother got a Gears of War 3 Xbox for Christmas. So everybody in the house had it. So we had a big four player of Horde and four separate TVs and it's absolutely fantastic fun. So I'm keen to play it again. Okay. Um, I've played a bit of it and I've enjoyed the online. I'm, I'm never a massive fan of, you know, competitive multiplayer anyway. I mm -hmm. always like co-op games. That's why I quite like Battlefield 3 because, which is funnily enough, a game we didn't mention at all. No, we didn't. We didn't out. even mention it last year. And yet, no? that, that's all we play now to socialize with each other. Yeah. So there you go. But um, I like I like games where there's a cooperative element inside a competitive bit. So whenever we play together, you know, we play in a squad and have mm -hmm. our unique roles. I don't like that kind of every man for himself kind kind of thing because I don't I don't like that aspect of beating your friends at a game and bragging about it. I don't know if that does that even make sense. Yeah, no, you can because you can still be on the losing team, but come out the top of off your team. Yeah. So you've got different games in a sense that people can be going for different objectives, and that's one thing in Call of Duty. The big difference in Call of Duty and Battlefield, of course, mm -hmm. Call of Duty, there's you could play that multiplayer in a very single-minded way, almost yeah. like a single player. Um, whereas what we found with, with, with Battlefield is we really have to be talking to each other well, uh, when we're crashing helicopters <laughs> into mountains. Yeah, that was that was fun. Our, our best Battlefield experience was that uh, we found this helicopter and I jumped in and then Craig got into the gunner's seat and he said, do you know how to fly a helicopter? Just as it flew backwards and exploded <laughs> into a mountain. And then it was Craig's turn and he did the exact same thing going, oh no, they're hard to steer, they're hard to steer. <laughs> Who puts this on the right analog stick? No. I should really have been annoyed that, you know, you, you thought it was my ineptitude that was uh, causing us to die when it's just that those choppers just don't handle the way they should. No, they're not realistic. They're not, they're not, they're not real. It's not a realistic game. It's not. It's just a, it's a farcical comic adaptation of war. So actually, I've got a couple of questions about the Gears of War storyline. Locus Queen, what was up with her? Um, she's dead now, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, oh, hold on. Spoilers. Warning. Spoilers. Here come the spoilers. The game's been out last year. We're fine. We're 20, it's 2012. 2012 is the year of no spoilers. If the year of no spoilers? year of no spoilers. Is that if because you, we're not going to say them or because there'll be no limits? We're not going to use it as limitations. Surely anyone who's reading a review wants... Uh, they're forfeiting the right to be have that, that ignorance going into it. I think we need to have a more full and frank discussion about this at a later date. I think I should uh, make a note on... Um, I could make a note in the water I spilled on the table. I could probably eke, eke out a point to we'll come back to that. Thing. Okay, I'll leave that. I'll leave that uh, to the side then. But yeah, so locusts did not turn out to be humans. No, they didn't. I don't really understand. They, there wasn't a lot of plot expo exposition in Gears of War. Um, apart from, it seems there's quite a few monsters coming out of the earth mm -hmm. and. Uh, Really, Marcus, what I think would be most pertinent would be if we were to murder every one of those monsters. Yeah, I've actually read uh, an interesting little blog post where, which posited that it's, it took a sort of genocide reading of it. Um, it really, I mean, that's that, that's the that's the conclusion to the game is that uh, you commit genocide in this race. Hooray! And, uh, and it's one of the things where it's probably not intentional. Uh, they're not saying, like, this is what this game is about. But when you then load the entire uh, Gears universe with uh, all the American stereotypes, you have the black football player, you have the cowboy southern guy in the hat... Yeah, you sort of wander into that territory where you could you could read that the, from it. The story is a lot better than the other ones. Mm. There's a really good bit um, in the first act when Cole goes into his old thrash ball stadium and it does this really cool flashback to whenever he was there. And it's a, it's a, I think it's the only time I've ever been emotionally affected by a Gears of War game, apart from you know raw testosterone being pumped into me. Yeah. But I thought it was actually a good story, and I think it, it's a, in a way it's a shame that it took them three games to come up with that. Um, but yeah, but no, it was, it was really enjoyable, and I thought it was quite a satisfying conclusion. As That's long true. as you forget all the bits about the genocide yeah, and the fact that you know it's like you've got this race of of dumb savages that come out of the earth, and the humans kill them all because they can't reason with them. I think there's a. I think it would be very easy to take that too far and make make a mountain out of a, an emergency hole. Yep. Wait. And when you're standing up there with your testosterone, if you had connect at the time, 
It would have tracked your body movements when you were playing Child of Eden. What did Alan say about Child of Eden way back when? That's cool. Okay, uh, what else is cool? I know, Child of Eden. There's a game that's going to be cool. Um, <laughs> for me, this is going to be the reason to get Connect. Uh, my brother got Connect for Christmas, and it does actually work. Okay, um, so yeah, my brother got Connect for Christmas. It does work. Um, Alan Claus bought me one in the Christmas sale. Um, actually, I went to get it on a whim because the new Xbox dashboard came out, mm-hmm. and it was all fully Connect enabled. And as you we were chatting in the train earlier about uh, how Microsoft have re-envisioned the keyboard <laughs> for the, the 21st century. And you've got a, a, a five meter long computer with a, a single string of keys. They've laid out their keyboard A to Z in one horizontal line. And I haven't seen that since primary school. I haven't seen that ever. You didn't go to primary school? We I, didn't go to the same primary school, I guess. No, we didn't. Uh, no. But my primary school had, had BBC Micros. They had a proper keyboard. That's pretty cool. I mean, when they're pasted on the wall and it's like A for Apple, and then you get Kicking K and Curly C and things like that. Uh, Kicking King. Yeah. And uh, there was a Thomas T. Thomas something. I don't know. I don't know. Every, everyone I'm thinking of in my head has just become offensive, so I'm just going to quickly move on from this bit. Floundering F. Floundering F. Sleeping Z. So yes, Connect. I got one, and I really like it, and I'm actually quite pleased that... I guess it's kind of fits in better to the kind of games I play now, which is you know I come home nine to five, I'm a sleepy boy, um, so either I need to get up off my seat and play like some Dance Central, which I am not good at, mm-hmm. um, or Connect Adventures, or you can just sit down and use that to navigate through the dashboard. The main problem is space. Um, looking around your living room, you probably would have enough space, mm-hmm. but mine's a much more. It's it's very constricted. And uh, I didn't think it was possible to move my coffee table. It was far down my room. That's what I was wondering about, because I've seen uh, way back when they showed it, I think it might have been Forza 4, one of mm-hmm. the racing games, where you can move your feet and it would be like the pedals. Well, Forza 4 has been somewhat toned down from then. Right, okay. Now all you do is you hold your hands up 10 and 2 and you tilt them left and right and it auto breaks. Right, okay. But like even then, what I was thinking of was like, well, do you have to move your coffee table for this? So it's all the Kinect stuff. Is it kind of from the waist up? No. Oh, right, um, okay. Depends on the game. Forza... What it does is whenever you go through the tuner, you can see what it can actually see in you. And you get this kind of skelly, skeletal mesh that comes over the top of your body. Right. So I know I'm doing hand movements and that's useless for a podcast. But if you imagine... He's waving them wildly and quite imagine, erotically. Imagine you're holding a tennis ball. Kind of like an Egyptian hand. dancer would in one of those films, like when they're moving the seven uh, fails off. Okay, everybody, including you, close your eyes for a second. Okay. Right. So imagine yourself with a tennis ball in each hand and a long pipe cleaner-like vein running the whole way along to your elbow joint and that your whole body's made up of pipe cleaners and tennis balls where there's a joint. That's what Connect sees you as. Are we smoking the joint, or are we... Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Al. <laughs> I did have my eyes closed there. I'll smoke your joint in a minute. Yay. Whee, whatever that means. Um, so with, with Forza, it knows that your hands are in place. For Dance Central, it looks like the whole body. Um, so... Generally, whenever you're playing a Connect game, you can see a small facsimile of what it can see in the corner yeah. of the screen, so you know if you're in space. Oh, uh, so you're um, not just waving. Yeah, so you're hoping not just, it's gonna you're, something's gonna happen. It's not like just dance on the way. It actually is recognizing your body. Okay, okay, that's cool. um, Whether or not the, the game software is nuanced enough to take advantage of that um, is another matter entirely, isn't it? Um, so, Child of Eden, um, I got for a fiver from Asda. That's unbelievable. Which is, you were looking so forward to that. I know. And that was, in my mind, that was that was potential game of the year. Yeah. Um, well, especially was, after your, our, your review. It was our runner-up in, in game of the year. Yeah. It's it's great. It is really good with Connect. Um, but, I mean, I, I stand by what I said in my review, which is, it's better with Connect, but it's not for everyone. Um, and, but, you know, I don't really care. It was a game I bought for me, not for other people to come around and play, because I yeah. don't need to validate my choices like that. <laughs> Speaking of validating your choices, um, I'd also talked about how I was going to get an iPad too, yeah. and presumably an iPhone 5. Because so we thought it would be, I think like everyone else, iPhone 5. They somewhat brought toned that down to the iPhone 4S. See, I kind of think now like that at the time everybody was talking about the iPhone 5, but it was only like... You, Silly, silly analysts and people that hadn't really thought it through properly. Mm. It doesn't make sense for Apple to fundamentally revise the design of their flagship product every year because it disrupts, like the you know, disrupts the whole manufacturing ecosystem. Think of the amount of millions of dollars they have to go into prototyping and machining those things and yeah, come yeah. up with an assembly line. So it makes more sense for it to be a 4S. And really, the only problem people had with the iPhone 4 was that the um, that the, the antenna dropped out if you held it in your hand, which the iPhone 4S fixes. Mm. So, what more could you want, really? Now more phone, even phonier than ever before. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I mean, I upgraded from a 3GS, 
um, which, as you'll know, doesn't have a very good camera. No. Um, but the 4S is really good. There's lots of nice, like, tap-to-hold focus things. It's it's really quite clever, and it is a good it is a good replacement for a standard point-and-shoot, especially since I've bought the big Canon mega camera yeah. now. It's yeah. nice to have the iPhone in the pocket. So I bought both of those, and the Apple Love Affair continued. But since I started my new job, I do kind of have a, an attraction towards Linux, because every time I use a computer, I get more and more annoyed because it never seems to do what I want it to do. So I think in about five years, I'll be uh, typing up my split screen work from a command line, just a black screen with white text, and me crying softly to myself on an IBM <laughs> keyboard from the 80s. <laughs> and, it, and it gets sent to me, and it gets printed out on a dot matrix roll that comes to the ground, and I like wheel over like Desmond in the hatch, slide over to my laptop and upload it online, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, you'll, have to, you'll have to get some OCR sc- software for your scanner. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, oh, Appar- apparently, I predicted something about Samsung getting embroiled in more copying uh, controversy. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember making this incredibly insightful point, which I made. It's proof. There's proof. Like, I might... Is it? Buddy that uses it. Um, I know. So, <laughs> as, as, it's not there. It's not there. That's just you talking. But in, in there, in that episode, there was. Yeah, well, I I think there was. Maybe I had a momentary lapse of consciousness and uh, was just thinking about something, about Samsung being embroiled in controversy and thought you said it. I guess that's also possible. That's true. Uh, <laughs> so what, speaking but, of uh, we've now gone through every single one of the 20 games I was interested in what did, what were you interested in last year and how did that turn out I believe last year the only thing I mentioned was Portal 2 the sequel no one asked for uh, we devoted my favourite podcast to actually still is the uh, Portal 2 podcast where we went through in fun detail we talked about the story a lot and I guess that's something I was kind of happy with we weren't necessarily happy with everything that they did all the decisions that they made mm-hmm. but now that there's been those few months that have, have, have separated it, yeah, that was a very good game. That was very fun. I, it was interesting that quite a lot of people did did put it as their their overall game of the year. I don't think it was anywhere near as uh, impressive as, as Skyrim looked or Child of Eden. <laughs> I don't think it was nearly as impressive as the Skyrim trailer. <laughs> Skyrim looked. Skyrim looked. Yeah, but you did I say trailer? No, but that that's what I'm saying. No, because well, I didn't you're play basing it. that in the trailer because you haven't played it. Yeah, yeah of course. I'm completely siding with the screen you wore. Uh, I was just, uh, I was just saying um, that. Yeah, you can't really say it wasn't as good as Skyrim if you haven't played both. Yeah. But I've played both and it wasn't as good as Skyrim, so that neatly clears that one up. But we devoted a whole podcast to it. I urge you all to go and seek out. Yeah, you better, because we know who listens, and we'll find you if you haven't listened. If if you think you can get away with listening to just this one podcast, I've got nine friends I'd like you to meet. Each of them varying lengths and varying qualities. <laughs> I thought the nine friends were the nine other subscribers, and we would get them together and like keep them, and then make them into some sort of human centipede. Get, get some, get some listener feedback. That'd be good. Two thousand twelve, though. Oh, I feel like you know we 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 were out last night with some some old friends, and we we deferred our New Year's partying until last <laughs> night because I feel absolutely shattered. I'm historically hung over right now. I'm I'm not actually hung over. I've just got that kind of. I've got that roaring boil kind of sore throat going on and I'm just a sleepy boy I've got a big bus ride back to Oxford so I'm going to have a kip but 2012 for gaming um, I'm, I'm actually quite ambivalent towards it I I mean first of all I have to clear off all the games I didn't play in 2011 and 2010 yeah. I'm looking at you Bioshock 2 Halo ODST Nier Rayman Origins yeah. you uh, need to Battle play through Reach three. with me yeah I need to play through I need to give you a reach around yeah um uh, so we actually had to go on Wikipedia and look at a list of games that were coming out in 2012 so we could find some we liked. This is the situation that we've got ourselves into. So, 2012 is the year of Mass Effect 3, hopefully, which I said I was looking forward to last year, and that has not changed. I'm still looking forward to it. Yep. I think um, whenever I did, whenever we did our first podcast was just after Christmas, and I just reviewed Mass Effect 2, and so, you know... I was still a bit chumescent over it, and I've calmed down a bit now, but I'm looking forward to it, and I'm interested to see where the Connect integration goes, mm-hmm. where you can deliver voice commands to your teammates, because that could surround the whole problem of Mass Effect not having a terribly good user interface. I think where we mentioned earlier about Duke Looking Forever being crass, and the way that it portrayed women um, as a Saints Row 3 and a lot of other games, it's be interesting to see what the Tomb Raider reboot is going to be like, where now that they've got a solid female protagonist at the front, whether they scale it back from what it has been in the past or what else is out there in the field uh, I'll be curious to see what they can they can do um, but I noticed like 
because this is a it's a reboot, it's a kind of an origin story, and the trailer from my vague memory of it um, had Lara kind of going through these caves, but she seemed to spend a lot of time falling off things. It's not like she's running around with her her two huge guns and also an assortment of weaponry, uh, fighting lots of monsters. I had to make a breast joke. It's Tomb Raider. We're progressive. The Tomb Raider, I'm actually looking forward to that as well, because I like, I like action adventure games. Yeah, so it, uh, the sense of exploration is more fun than this kind of run down a corridor and kill the monsters. Yeah, and I wasn't able to play Uncharted because I don't have a PS3, so if it taps some of that, that would be kind of cool. Here's a prediction for you. I will not buy a PS3 in 2012, oh. and that's because every time I think I want a PS3, I end up at home and I play my dad's so within about five minutes, I no longer want a PS3. Yeah. It is just not designed for playing games on. Whenever you, you're playing the Xbox, okay, they've they've gone a step back with the new dashboard, but it's still good. You can still navigate through your games and see who's online and your friends. The PS3 one, well, you have to jump through hoops for absolutely everything. It's pants. I just, and then you have to download a million firmware updates. Mm-hmm. You have to mandatorily install games to the hard drive. It's in terms of the actual games you're playing on it. Yeah, they're the same as the Xbox, but actually getting in and playing that game, I just find a really frustrating process. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's quite bad because the next game I have on my list of games for 2012 is The Last Guardian which is a PS3 exclusive no really <laughs> really <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> okay well Fair enough. just because it's on my list and I want to play it doesn't mean I can't appreciate it from before um, The Last Guardian is the kind of the next spiritual sequel in the uh, Eco and Shadow of the Colossus series so it's about um I, well, I don't really know. I've only seen a couple of movie clips, but it's about a young boy and this uh, kind of crazy griffin dog character, and he has to kind of lead it out of a castle. So yeah, you have to you have to influence how it acts, and you don't control it directly. And also, it's a really cute animal, and I like cute animals. Nice. Uh, so I've got a, a, a question for you. Um, right. One of my most anticipated games of the year is Metal Gear Rising, um, which has been renamed for Metal Gear Solid Rising because it's no longer being developed by Kojima Studios. Okay. It's now being developed by Platinum Games. You may uh, remember who, from, I, from Bayonetta. Oh, Bayonetta. Okay. And Mad World and Vanquish. Oh, I, yep. So they have given it a subtitle. Okay. It is a one-word subtitle. Okay. Um, it... It kind of means it's a bit like. Oh no! Okay, it, it begins with the letter R. I see. It begins with the letter R. Yeah, how I many, actually many... haven't given you a correct number of stars there. It's quite a long word. How many syllables? Three. Three syllables. Yeah. Could you stand up and do charades for me? I have no idea how I would do that in charades. That's... Go for it. Oh my god! It's not even. It's a made-up portmanteau word. That's going to be terrible. Okay, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so. Okay, Alan is standing up. He's three fingers extended on the left hand. Three syllables. Thumb up. First finger. One. One. First one. syllable. First syllable. Okay. Um, he's uh, he's moving both hands over in like this kind of cyclical motion. Uh, he's, he's, he's wanting me to keep going on a cyclical uh, re- uh, revolving... Oh, because it begins with R. Revolving. Revolution. This Revolutionary. This is the first syllable. Oh, Rev. Shorter. Re? Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> Next part. Um, sorry. Okay, I'm just going to give up on this, I'm sorry. All the right, name okay. of the game is Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. What? <laughs> A mixture of revenge and vengeance. Revengeance. Revenge. Revengeance. Yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, what you, that's what you meant to think. Like, why couldn't they just have revenge? Or okay. better yet, Metal Gear Rising. Because There's no other Metal Gear Rising. There's no need for a sub. I it's not like a, it's not like with Metal Gear Solid, where there were legitimately four other games. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Revengeance. Revengeance. Yeah. Are who are you revenging against? <laughs> I don't even know. It's Re- just too good. Sorry, just... revengeing against. The, the revengeing is probably going to be the Metal Gear Rising Two. Well, the, the I, I, mean, I, I like the the insane stories that that they tend to take on. I wonder if that will get toned back then if Kojima isn't involved. No, basically still what's writing that, it. I would strongly advise you watch the trailer because what they've yeah. done is they've said this isn't Kojima's game anymore. This is our game. Um, and the best bit in the trailer is when he picks up a robot by a leg and throws it into a building. Um, it's basically going to be Metal Gear meets Bayonetta, which is why I'm. Gone, gone from don't give a toss to being super, super excited. Ah, so you get to play as Raiden and actually do all the acrobatic stuff yeah. that you saw in the cutscenes and you sat there and were like, well, it'd be nice if I could play this. Yeah, it's kind of like, imagine if you played the cutscenes from a Metal Gear game, wouldn't that be good? And they've, they've taken that 
So what's your most anticipated games of 2012? Um, I'll need to check that it's actually coming out this year. It should have done, because it was meant to come out at the end of the previous year and did not, but the commercial release of Dear Esther. The... Dear Esther was the mod that I wrote about a while ago, where you're wandering around one of the aisles, maybe Isle of Wight, and it's just a very kind of somber, is moody it, game. Is the commercial release going to be really different from the mod? They have, I believe, um, it's a level designer from Mirror's Edge has come involved in it, and it, again, like the Metal Gear Rising trailer is something that you, you you should look out and see. You always see these tech demos where people show off their environment and yeah. there's all this nice drippy caves with the styling lights coming down and it's very you, you can almost get the sense of smell from the surrounding. Mm-hmm. And then you see the actual game comes out and you're like, oh, okay, well they have to tone that down because there's all this action. Well because there's no action in the game they can actually just pour uh, all of that yeah. into how it looks. So the commercial release of this is actually going to amp put a lot more style into a game that already had quite a bit of substance. So that's why I'm actually excited for that's it. pretty good. But is, um, it, is the actual bulk of the game going to be quite similar then? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to keep in the dark about uh, the, to, to, uh, some of the details, but I imagine it won't be too different from it. Um, perhaps they'll go in different directions, maybe extend it a little bit, but I don't know where else you could take it. Why else you would no, why not, want to take it anywhere else? That's not well. <laughs> People, people like their value for money. They want these 40 hour, 40 hour games, don't they? That's true. Uh, perhaps Fez will be a 40 hour game. Um, it's been, it's depending it, on how clever you are. It's taken about five or six years for this this, this chap to make it. And it's a, one of those interesting 2D slash 3D platformers. Um, if anyone played Super Paper Mario on the Wii, and you had those parts where you could flip it uh, from yes. the two dimensions to three. If you, if you think about that and you were flipping a cube around, and you could have all well, four faces of it that you can run along... It's very much like that, um, and and it's 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 just a, a little puzzly game, very retro look to it. It looks interesting. Um, I've got a game on my iPhone called Percepto, which basically does it in a str- stripping all of the niceness away in a, in a pretty <laughs> crappy looking puzzle game for fifty pence, but it's fantastic. But yeah, I'd like to see what uh, all the years of investment have actually produced. I'm I'm quite curious to see if this is the year when there's going to be a big turning point and people are just going to play games on phones and tablets. And I'm eager to see how the 3DS and the Vita do. Um, I wouldn't see myself buying a PlayStation Vita. No. Um, nah. I just... Well, I didn't buy I, a I wouldn't buy a DS now. Yeah. I, well, see, I, um, I don't know if we'll get a 3DS. Probably not because the battery life's so terrible. If, but I don't play my DS. If we're talking about a game, like portable, and that's the point, when we're out waiting uh, on trains and buses, mm. well, I've got my phone on me mm. all the time. I would never really take my DS... I would think about it when I took my Game Boy out of the house was only ever on plane flights. I'd just rather read a book now. That's I'd what rather I do, just yeah. read a book or read a pile of magazine articles I've cashed onto my iPad. I just I can't be bothered to sit down for something that takes that amount of effort. No, but uh, my actual my favourite game, my secret game. Uh, oh yes, the secret game. The secret game of twenty ten is of course, Alan. It's the London twenty ten Olympics. Yeah. I'm gonna be in London for it. Yeah twenty ten Olympics. Oh shit, did I say twenty ten? Yeah. Oh, twenty twelve. Do you want to try that again? No, I think we should just end on that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, you can't end on the 2010 Olympics.